Hello there everybody and welcome to the return of the verdict here on Racing TV. We're delighted to be back and we're going to be taking a look at the best of the action from York's Dante meeting. It was a fantastic meeting with some really decent performances. We could have picked a whole host of races to analyse but we've gone with the best that we thought uh, we could give you and we're going to have a look at the sectional times as well as looking at every race in full. Now the sectionals will look uh, like this. I'll take you through the sectionals uh, for every single race that we are going to look at. That there happens to be uh, the Dante Stakes and uh, it was won by Hurricane Lane, the gallon in second place and High Definition was back in third place. One of the interesting points that you'll want to note are the last three furlongs here and you'll see 36.17 for Hurricane Lane, 36.26 for McGallan and 36 dead for high definition. So he, having got outpaced, was finishing off quite strongly. The first and the third, both very strong stairs. Let's have a look at the race in its entirety then. I think this was probably uh, quite a good renewal of this particular race. It certainly produced a decent overall time and they went an honest gallop and it was Holly Doyle who set the pace on Roman Empire. She went straight to the front and she made every yard into the home straight at a decent gallop and then she kicked and she caught them all a little bit flat-footed for a while on a horse Roman Empire who's uh, bred to, for speed rather than for stamina. There's a lot of speed in the pedigree and this horse possibly will drop back in trip now. Let's pick out the one, two, three here. Here's the winner, right on the outside, William Buick on Hurricane Lane, the son of Frankel, unbeaten son of Frankel. And this is a very good performance from him. McGallan is right in there, red cap, just uh, hidden away and high definition is there in third place. This was the, the best performance of McGallan's career and high definition. He is a very, very strong stayer. This race run at an honest gallop and he just kept rolling along. The sectionals tell us that he just kept pounding out the fractions in the closing stages. His dams by Scirocco, he himself by Frankel. And that tells us a couple of things. One, he's always going to be a strong stayer and he will relish going up to a mile and a half for the derby. And on day one of the Dante Festival, there was some cut in the ground. And look how he bends his knee there and grabs the ground. And being uh, by Frankel, out of a Scirocco mare, I think he's always going to want a little bit of dig in the ground. So if he came up really fast at Epsom, running down the hill to Tatham Corner on perhaps good to firm ground, that would be a slight worry as far as he's concerned. Now positionally, it's quite an interesting race. If we stop them there, you'll see that he's in quite a good position uh, to attack. Here he is right there. He's in a good position to attack Roman Empire, who's established a five or six length advantage. High definitions a long way back and he gets outpaced readily once they turn into the home straight. You can see Brian Moore's just niggling away on him, uh, just towards the outside. He's one, two, three, four, five, sixth there. I'll pick him out. I, th I think this is a lot better run than some people would have, but there he is just in there, already being scrubbed along by Ryan Moore, horse who was undefeated as a two-year-old, had a slight blood problem, so we didn't see him in the Lingfield at Derby trial. So an interrupted preparation, and look there, niggled along, not going as well as many of his rivals, particularly McGallan, who's cruising up, and high definition is just being wound up at this stage to go and chase uh, Roman Empire. Look at high definition, still really very flat-footed. He's been caught out by an injection of pace, and the winner's picking up. But I don't think there was any horse in this race which was a cruise and quicken type. This was very much a severe test of stamina. They went a really good gallop and it was about staying the trip. McGallan, what do we make of him? Well, I thought he travelled best in the race, but he didn't quite see it out as well as High Definition. who was really pounded his way to the front and kept going. Now here's High Definition firing the fastest last final furlong and getting pretty close to them in the end. That was quite a good performance from High Definition and we'll just highlight that once again by firstly looking at the finishing speed percentage. You can see here that they finish off at 105.2 the winner, which means he finished the last three furlongs at 5.2% quicker than he ran the rest of the race. So he was pretty well rated by William Buick, but he is a stayer. He's not a horse with a turn of foot, but this is the important part here, I think. These last three furlongs, 36 dead for High Definition. He was coming home pretty well, 36.17 for Hurricane Lane and McGallan quite slow, 36.26. So overall, what do we think we saw? Well, I think we saw two very stout stayers, high definition and indeed the winner as well, Hurricane Lane. And I think they'll both go to the Derby with a bit of a chance. Of course, 
Derby's over, isn't it? Bullshow Bally's going to win that. But anyway, he's seven to four. High definition, four to one on the on the back of that. Hurricane Lane, a big looking seven to one. He beat he beat high definition fair and square. And sevens looks big enough. John Leaper sevens and seven to one, um, Mahafeth. Uh, as well. Front of the market looks very solid there. I think it's a slightly better performance from high definition than he was, uh, and, than he was given credit for, and indeed the winner as well. OK, we have a quick look at uh, the Musidora now. This was a very interesting race. The sectionals uh, are fascinating because look at the finishing speed percentage. This is what you've got to note. It's all we need to know here. Look, 112.28. What we've got is a slowly run race dictated by snowfall uh, from the front. She was even able to do some very slow fractions, 13.3, 14.28. So she dictated the race from the front. Now, when a horse does this, do we, do we say, OK, she's got an easy lead and she's just beaten them because she's got a soft advantage? Well, there is that element in this particular contest. Look at her there, right on the outside cruising along Ryan Moore just edging across and bringing her across to the rail to dominate this race now in behind I'm just going to pick out these two horses that were second and third there's the Sir Michael Stout horse and there's Tiona who's back in third Sir Michael Stout's neon star back in second and they are both pulling and reefing you can see how high Tiona's head is and it's likewise the filly that won in the fast time at Weatherby neon star meanwhile Ryan Moore doing what he wants out in front and uh, he's really ridden them to sleep here. The fillies in behind just wouldn't settle and he was able to dictate as he wanted. But do we put this win down just to that or do we put it down to the fact that she's probably the best filly in the race and would have won this however it was run? Well, I think that's probably the case. It was certainly a step up of what she achieved last year as a two-year-old and she came here only rated at 90, but she enjoyed the step up in trip and she enjoyed being rated out in front. But the way she surges clear from some of her rivals in the closing stages suggests to me that she is a very good filly indeed. And I think she'd have won even if they'd gone a, a strong gallop. There's an interesting mid-race move. It comes from uh, Tiona in behind, who's second last at this stage. And she's just far too keen for her own good. She probably wasn't ready for a test like this, having not had much racing experience. But in a moment, she'll be switched to the outside and she makes a big move, which the sectionals highlight from her. And then she pays for that later on, and indeed pays for pulling hard too. But I still think she remains a filly of a good deal of potential at Tiona. It's this, at this point now that Andrea Seni begins to make a move on her. The runner-up has run perfectly well, uh, Neon Star, but she too was a little bit keen in the early stages. She's over on the far side. Uh, she picks up okay. There's, there's the big move from Atseni on Tiona. He's let her go now, but that effort tells late on. And now Ryan Moore can quicken from the front and she's got an advantage in front. She's able to go first, and she puts in a very quick furlong, three to two snowfall, and that's what's won in a race. And she would be impossible to catch, uh, given the easy lead she got and that furlong that she put in. That burst finished off Tiona, and it also finished off Lenny on Star on the, the far side. I'm not sure this was a race with a lot of strength in depth, but I think she's a very good filly, and it's dangerous to suggest that she only won because she got an easy lead. She won because she was the best filly in the race. I'll just have a quick look at the sectionals once again and highlight here some of the, the speeds that she went. So we're looking at 13.01 for her there. 13.63, 14.85, Ryan slowing it right down, 13.3, and then suddenly, whoosh, 11.62, and that finished her rivals off. That 11.62 furlong was really, really important. He crawled along, then he went, and when he asked her to go, she fired in that 11.62, and that finished her rivals off, who'd been far too keen. So what about the Oaks then? How do we think she's gonna get on in the Oaks? Well, uh, the bookmakers make a second favorite. Skybet have got her in at four to one. Santa Barbara for the end of Brian team, fourth in the thousand guineas is 15 to eight. Zayada seven to one. Tiona in there at eight, she'll have to settle. She'll have to relax. Dubai Phantom nines and Noonstar, 12 to one. Noonstar, just a quick word on her. She is better than the bare result there. She fired a very quick time when she won at Weatherby and that might just have taken the edge off her a little bit and she was a bit too keen. She's a much better filly uh, than we saw there in the Musidora, but to Snowfall, it would be very, very wrong to underestimate her performance, even though she got an easy lead. Three more races for you now uh, here in the verdict and we're going to start sprinting uh, on the first day of the Dante Festival and the ground was on the easy side. Uh, the Duke of York 
was uh, one of the big races uh, on the card. Uh, those are the sectional times. And you'll see that Starman beat Nahar and that beat uh, Oxted. And uh, it was quite a good overall time, 1.11.24. But for a sprint, this was quite steadily run. And you can see from that, the finishing speed percentage. For a sprint, you should be looking at being around about 100, maybe just dipping under 100. And they go hard early on and then getting a little bit tired late. But they finished off quicker through the final three furlongs and they ran the rest of the race at 106.01. Uh, for the winner. So this, this wasn't a flat out sprint. Let's have a look at it uh, from the start then. And let me remind you that uh, Starman uh, was your winner and beat to Nahar, who I think shapes with an abundance of promise and Oxted, who possibly wants a stiff six back in third. Send them on their way now. Most of the action coming far side to middle. You didn't really want to be stand side at all. Uh, during this meeting. The ground seemed to be worse there uh, and you really wanted to be over on the far side. So we'll just pick these horses out and your winner, the Starman, is just there, just getting a nice toe uh, into the race and, and travelling really well. Trained by Ed Walker and, and going places really. He's a very good sprinter indeed. This is the horse to keep an eye on. I think he's a real eye catcher. Nahar was uh, back in second place and uh, Oxted finished in third. But watch Nahar, I think this is a really interesting run. And perhaps controversial, I might upset my good friend George Baker by saying this, because uh, he works to a degree for Ed Walker and uh, loves Starman, but I think Nahar probably should have won this race. Look where he's decided to go, Tom Mark, and he's decided to join the horses more towards uh, the stand side. And then he realizes that's not the place to go, and he sort of edges across to the other side and gets himself in behind Starman. But in a steadily run sprint, Starman's just got a positional advantage on him. So Markant's now just going to edge across. There he goes. He's gone behind Brando and he's gone right round across to go and track Starman. He realised he wasn't in the right place. And now the one, two are here, right in the middle of the track where you really wanted to be. And it was absolutely no good being anywhere down this, down this side at all. You wanted to be towards the middle. And look where the first two are. And the third Oxted is coming from a little bit nearer uh, the stand side and stays on quite strongly in the closing stages. But the middle was the place to be. And Nahar has lost a bit of ground, having had to switch away from the bad ground into the middle of the track and then go and have to chase Starman, who quickens up first and just to a degree gets first run on him. But Nahar never stops. He knuckles down, as does Starman, and they have a really good set too, all the way to the line. But it's hard not to conclude, I think, looking at that race and looking at the sectionals, that Nahar probably was the best horse in the race. We'll just have another look at uh, those sections and look at the finishing speed percentages and the final three furlongs. And the final three furlongs, Starman 33.6. Now look at Nahar, 33.32. And he's had to switch to get that run away from slower horses to track the fast horse Starman. And he just narrowly didn't peg him back. He probably wants a bit further Nahar, but he's clearly a progressive sprinter and a stiff six furlongs will definitely suit him. And if they were to meet at Ascot in the Diamond Jubilee, I wouldn't be guaranteeing that Starman would beat him again. But let's have a look at the betting for that race. Three to one Starman, dream of dreams, a six to one shot. Um, he's got a good record at uh, Ascot, a little bit of cutting the ground suits him. There's Nahar, seven to one. I think that's a fair price. Extravagant Kid is in an eight to one. Glass Slippers eight, since so ten to one and bigger the rest. A really good sprint, perhaps not run at a breakneck gallop that you would normally expect of a top class sprint. Starman is clearly top class and he's getting better, but do keep an eye on uh, Nahar over Stiff Six. I think he's a very interesting horse. Right, we're going to have a look at uh, the Oak Farm Phillies uh, contest now, which is won by Primo Bazio. I put the figures up first once again here because what you're going to see is that this was a very steadily run affair and it turned into a little bit of a sprint. That tells us all we need to know. 109.41, the finishing speed percentage. And if we edge across, you'll see that she came home very quickly. 34.07 and her final three furlongs, 11.29. And then she went 11.15 and 11.63. She was flying home in this race that was steadily run early on. Here we go. Let's send them on their way. Now, usually in a steadily run race, uh, common wisdom has it that you don't really want to be out the back. You want to be close to the pace and the first to kick and have a positional advantage. But really, you want to be on the fastest horse because if a race turns into a sprint, you need to be on a horse who can really sprint. And those numbers have highlighted that she can really go. And where is she at this stage? There she is. 
right at the back. What a good performance this is. She's a lightning quick filly. The runner up is there. Got a positional advantage. And there's Snow Lantern, who was a bit disappointing. Why was Snow Lantern disappointing? Well, if you just have a look, look how keen Snow Lantern was. Got a very sharp hold of the horse's head, Snow Lantern, and she just wanted to do too much and did too much. Send them on their way now. And this is a Prima Bazzia. This is a filly who's better than the bare result. She's a little bit keen in last. And you'd have thought in running, she wasn't going to win this. You'd have thought perhaps Creative Flair was going to kick from the front and steal this race. But no, she doesn't have the foot, the speed, the raw speed that Prima Bazzio has got. And I think she could be a very good filly going forward. Miles better than this, this bare result. And there could be a lot more to come from her. Snow Lantern's going well in this stage, the grey filly down towards the inside, but she's just doing a little bit too much. She'd have been impressive last time up when winning. You can see there, she's still pulling. And that's a function of the steady pace. Uh, and perhaps maybe this has come a, a little bit soon for her after her, her latest win. Or she just probably wants a better gallop to go at. Now watch Prima Bazzio. This is the important bit. This is what matters. This is a proper turn of foot. This is absolute lightning from Prima Bazzio over on the far side. She's going to pick up in a minute and you will see her go. And she goes flying past these fillies. She gets to creative flair in a matter of strides. Says, go now. Whoosh, that's race over. Creative Flair, bad luck, I'm coming. And those figures that I showed you earlier on, that's what she's doing now. She's doing 11.16 furlong, and nothing can do that in this race. And just in that one single movement, in that one single 11.16 furlong, she sprinted clear of them. That was very, very impressive from Prima Bazzio. Let's just talk about a two-year-old that uh, caught the eye, uh, Project Dante. Uh, I thought he was pretty good, one for the, the Brian Smart team. Uh, watch stall four here. Uh, he wins from there. There is a massive eye catcher for me, and it is Corker who finishes second from stall seven. And why is he a massive eye catcher? Because of the track, the way the track was playing. Now the stalls were placed on the worst bit of the track, the slowest bit of the track. The third horse dives left in the Hamdan Maktoum colors, uh, Jadlan. And uh, he's run very well in third place, but dive left, didn't get any cover. That's what happens if you're drawn on the wing sometimes on a newcomer. Um, meanwhile, watch what happens to the principals. Number seven, yellow cap, is your winner. Straight in behind is Corker, travelling with the white cap closest to the stands rail, where you didn't want to be. Nonetheless, Corker runs an absolute blinder, staying on very strongly, and he's only just denied, but denied by a good two-year-old for Brian Smart. This is a pretty good time overall and uh, it ranked pretty well when you looked at other sprints through the meeting and I think this is very good form. Here comes Corker, didn't really want to be where he was in the race but now he's got a chance and he's laying it down to Project Dante who just will not give up. What a good debut effort this is. Jadlan over on the far side. I think it would be fair to say that the second and the third will win next time up. Let's have a quick look at the times that they posted here. The overall time, 59.37, not too bad at all. Uh, last three furlongs, 34.42 for Project Dante. And look at this from Corker, having raced on the worst bit of the track, 33.87. Corker was really coming home through those last three furlongs and was relatively unfancied in the market. So he's definitely a horse that you want to be with next time up, as is Jadlan, who's run uh, very well and stuck to it from a draw that was not ideal uh, for a newcomer. Some very interesting sprints, but I think I'll be with Corker uh, next time up and Nahar, possibly to beat Starman next time they meet. Uh, welcome back to The Verdict. A couple more races to have a look at. And we're going to start off uh, by taking you to the very first race of the meeting. And uh, it was a good handicap, really competitive one. And it was won by Illarab, who managed to beat uh, Raymond Tusk at Throne Hall, was uh, back in third place. And the one thing to note about this fellow as we bring up the course track sections is that he is a very, very strong stayer. And uh, his most impressive furlongs were the last couple, 12.09 and a 12.92. Uh, he was really very, very strong, staying on strongly. And if you look in that final column, furlong 12, and you scan down, you'll see that not one single horse managed to dip under 13 furlongs, except for him at 12.92. He was strongest at the finish. Let's have a look at it uh, now. This was a very competitive handicap, and he jumped out of stall uh, number seven. 
There he is, and he's beaten uh, Raymond Tusk, who came out of 14. It's pretty wide, Raymond. He's run pretty well uh, in third place. And Thronehall third, sorry, from stall number four. So we'll send them on their way here. Now, a win for Ilara, but number of points during this race did not look likely. Uh, but he's progressing rapidly, this uh, fella, and he found loads for Tom Marquand pressure inside the final three furlongs, which culminated in what we just saw from the figures, two very strong final furlongs. Just want to pick out one horse who I think a horse that we can follow going forward. Look how keen he is. It's um, Sam Cook. Went out to make the running. He was quite well supported, but he did too much in front. He was too keen, but he lasted a long time. Uh, and I think he'll be winning a race in the near future, but he just needs to drop his head and settle. You can see there how keen he is out in front. Ilarab dropped in uh, mid to, to rear at this stage in a race where the first couple of furlongs, as evidenced by Sam Cook, was quite steady, but thereafter they went a pretty even gallop. And I think it was a fair test at the trip of a, a mile and a half. And uh, this winner, well, he'll definitely uh, stay further. We're about just approaching halfway at this stage and he's quite a long way back. He's quite a fair way off the pace. So he's got work to do. He's just tucked in. He's just tucked in there as yellow colors. You can just spot them. He's between horses, so he's hard to uh, pick out, but he's got a little bit of work to do. He's got Raymond Tusk in front of him. He's got Throne Hall in front of him as well. Um, and it does look for quite a while in the home straight as if he's, he's not going to get there, but he hasn't racked up six wins in a row, not having plenty of ability. And he's definitely a pattern race performer, you'd have thought after uh, winning this. He'll have a, a place in the Ebor now, but uh, one wonders whether uh, pattern races is where his trainer William Haggis will want to go. I know that he's got an entry in the Hardwick Stakes, so that might be uh, something that they're, they're going to consider for him. But possibly up in trip, I think, because uh, he just to me looks like a, a very thorough stare. Sam Cook in front now. He's settled. He's dropped his head and he's going uh, quite nicely. Uh, the winner, he's still not making any progress. I'll pick him out. He's just in there. He's got quite a lot to do. He's quite a long way back, uh, but he'll begin to pick up uh, from three to one. And uh, he just outstays this lot and he's thoroughly, thoroughly progressive. Some of the others that, that ran well, I thought Raymond Tusk ran a big race because he was drawn wide. He was drawn in 14. He managed to get in. He jumped quite smartly from the gates. He got in and he's run a, a big race. A very good trip for the third, just thrown Hall, who jumped from four and he didn't give an inch of ground away. He's right down on the inside of this stage in the yellow colours uh, being rowed along. Now Ilarab is under pressure from Tom Markand and he's got a bit to do. Sam Cook's gone for home possibly too soon. He's going to run out of gas as well because he was too keen. Now Tom Markand's already at Ilarab. He's given him two reminders behind the saddle and he's about to switch him and bring him round here and go and attack the leader and go and try and get them. And he gets them pretty well. He finds loads for pressure, this fella. He's game, he's honest, he's tough, and he stays really, really well. He doesn't possess a turn of foot. He hasn't got that electric zip, but he grinds and grinds and grinds. As you can see from there, he does not stop. He just keeps rolling. Good second last furlong and a good final furlong, quicker than the others throughout those last two furlongs. His best two furlongs were definitely his last two, and that was a very good staying performance from him. We'll just revisit the sectionals, courtesy of Course Track, who uh, brought us these, and you can see those last couple of furlongs were very strong that I highlighted earlier on, and his last three furlongs at 36.84, compare that to the runner-up, 37.69, 37.86, and a 38.01 for the fourth. He's much quicker through the last three furlongs. In a strong year on race, he's a very strong stayer and he just keeps rolling. I'd love to see him at a mile and three quarters or just indeed a, a very strongly run uh, mile and a half. Thoroughly, thoroughly progressive. OK, let's move on. We're going to have a look at uh, the Middleton Stakes. I just wanted to look at this race because uh, Queen Power is the winner and I think uh, this is the best uh, performance of her career. So Michael Stout was winning this race for the seventh time. The first time he won it was 32 years ago. And this was the seventh time he's managed to uh, get it. Still won uh, Queen Power. And this race fell apart a little bit, but this is her best ever performance. And I think it's worth, worth highlighting just how much better than the rest she was by just looking at the, the finishing time. Two minutes, 9.89. Look at that. Two minutes, 11.42, the runner up. 2.12.21. She's absolutely thrashed them. 36.55 compared to 38.16 for the final three furlongs. She was miles better than these. Let's see how she did it. Just here with the hood on, Sylvester D'Souza, whoosh, off it goes. 
and she travels really strongly in this race and this was just a little bit quicker than the Dante in terms of uh, the overall time it's quite quite strongly quite strongly run uh, courtesy of the horses eventually that runner-up Shamard who jumped from stall two and went a good gallop out in front and uh, Caballetta was back in third place but at a distant third she's the grey filly out the back uh, but this race to an extent fell apart uh, and for what is it normally a very good group too and throws up some, some decent horses I don't think it's a particularly strong race but I think the performance of the winner who was stepping up in trip is a very good performance and she was able to quicken away from her rivals in very good style you can see her settled uh, just in behind and rather like Prima Bazio who we watched earlier on over seven furlongs she won that race with a turn of foot well this is a good turn of foot in this race albeit over further uh, from this uh, filly who's just got a nice toe she's got a nice sit uh, in behind it, there's, a, there's a small argument that the runner up in front perhaps kicked a little bit uh, too soon but I think that's splitting hairs really I just don't think uh, she was anywhere near good enough certainly not the ratings was she good enough to give Queen Power a race and uh, Queen Power has, has beaten them uh, very comfortably in the end a couple of the others are disappointed in the race I think it's fair to say I don't think it was a it was a race of great strength and it, and it fell apart a little bit but sometimes that doesn't matter sometimes you've got to ask yourself not what, what did a horse beat but how fast did that horse run in winning a race and this filly here ran very fast indeed it's produced quite a good uh, time form speed figure overall and here's the turn of foot here's where she quickens far side under Sylvester de Souza and she picks the runner up very easily Shamard and there she quickens now and she goes and she puts daylight between herself and the rest of them by quite a good way it was an impressive performance and I think they'll stick to a mile and a quarter with her now uh, going forward um, I wouldn't worry about who she beat but worry about how fast she ran and she ran pretty fast in this and it's a career best for her and another win in the race for uh, Sir Michael Stout visually she was a very impressive and the clock does back that up uh, as well that's the verdict then I, I hope you've enjoyed it uh, a good look back at some of the, the better races at uh, this year's uh, Dante Festival we'll see you next time